Hi, and welcome to the Cloaked AI demo part one, where I'll show you how to use Cloaked AI in standalone mode to protect vectors and metadata stored in Pinecone. In part two, we'll attack the vectors to try to invert them. We'll build this demo on top of Pinecone's own examples to illustrate how easy it is. From Pinecone's GitHub, head to the examples repository and then go into the docs folder and pick the semantic search example. Any of these will do, but this one is conveniently short. Now, you could launch this in your browser, which is great, but we're going to run it locally. It'll work the same either way, but look prettier. We're going to look at their example and fast forward since this isn't really about Pinecone, but since we do need to know a bit about how the code works before we can get started. The first important thing here is that we're using a repository of vectors that have already been generated by Pinecone using the mini LM embedding model. These also have sparse vectors from BM25, but they aren't used in this demo. This data set represents a whole bunch of Quora questions, though not the answers. They've chopped the full data set down to 80,000 rows to keep the example a little bit quicker. Now, the first thing to notice is that there's this column of dense vectors, and most of the values are quite near zero, certainly between 10 and negative 10. The second thing is that this example uploads the original sentence alongside the vector as metadata, which is fairly common pattern. Creating the index and uploading the vectors can take a few minutes, and you need to wait after creating before trying to upload. More than the one second of sleep they have here, more like 30 seconds. But once that's done, you'll have an index with a bunch of data. So if we go to our Pinecone login, we can see the new index there and click in. You can see there aren't any sparse values, but there are all of the dense vectors along with the metadata sent into it. So now we get to the important bit where queries are made. First, the mini LM model is initialized, so it can be used to encode the queries as vector embeddings. And running a query about cities with high populations comes back with semantically similar questions like, what's the world's largest city? The problem is that you're probably not putting public Quora questions into your vector database. Likely, you're putting private and confidential data in there. And redacting any of that data, even just names, makes it less useful as a search engine. So if we delete that metadata, we're still left with the vectors. And vectors can be inverted. That means they can be turned back into their original text. A huge number of academic papers has been created around this idea, along with open source software to reverse embeddings with up to 92% of those reversals getting exactly the original inputs and the remainder getting the inputs generally right in terms of meanings. So vectors can be mined and even full names extracted back out of them. And that's where Cloaked AI comes in. Over on the Iron Core Labs website, we can jump to the Cloaked AI page and learn more, or we can drop into the docs section and follow the getting started instructions, or just click around. In this case, though, we're actually going to head over to Iron Core's GitHub repository and drill directly into the Iron Core Alloy SDK, which houses the Cloaked AI functionality. Wait, Alloy, you say? Why not the Cloaked AI repo? Well, we're moving away from having a repo and an SDK for every different bit of functionality, and Alloy is or will be our master SDK that can just do everything. And we'll leverage the examples in the Python standalone directory as an inspiration. Before I jump into that, though, let me give you the basis for what we're doing as well as some intuition on it. Essentially, for the vectors, we're mapping from the embedding vector space into a different vector space entirely. If we were working with 2D vectors representing latitude and longitude, it'd be like mapping locations to a much bigger planet that's been tilted and spun and then jiggled everything up a bit. Neighbors are still neighbors, but if you want to do a search, you need the key to know where to start. The core of the algorithm comes from this paper, and the paper also holds proofs showing the level of security achieved. With that, let's dive in. First though, we need to add the Iron Core Alloy import. Following that, we'll download the same Pinecone dataset as before, and with that done, you can see that the values column, the dense vectors, have tiny numbers still in the plain text metadata as well, as you might expect. Creating the index is the same, but we'll rename the index to be clear about what's in Pinecone. And with everything ready, we need to encrypt the data before we can upload it. This chunk of code here is all new and is specific to Iron Core. The first thing we're doing is setting a key. Now, don't do it this way except to play around. This key should be fetched from somewhere secure like an HSM. We are in standalone mode here, meaning we're not integrating with Iron Core's encryption management functionality in SAS Shield. In standalone mode, we initialize each type of encryption with a master key. For vectors, we derive subkeys based on provided metadata, so one key is only used for one segment of data, and vectors can't relate across boundaries. Now we're setting our approximation factor to two, which is a good balance between security and usability. Above two, you get better security, but your nearest neighbor results may not be as good. 
So we're initializing the Iron Core Alloy SDK here, and we have to do each type of encryption separately, starting with the vector encryption, which we initialize with our key and approximation factor. Standard secrets just means regular random encryption using AES-256 GCM, which is suitable for encrypting metadata that we don't need to filter against, like the source text in our example. In this case, we're going to use the same master key. In standalone mode, this key isn't used to directly encrypt anything. Instead, we use envelope encryption. So every piece of data that is going to be encrypted gets its own unique and random key. And it's that key, the document encryption key, that's used to encrypt the data. Then that document encryption key is encrypted by the master key, which gives us an encrypted document encryption key, or EDEC, which you'll see later. And in this example, we aren't using deterministic encryption, but if we wanted to filter on categories or users or something within Pinecone, deterministic encryption would be a good choice. And finally, we're going to set up Alloy Metadata, which is the audit trail data and the identifier for the current tenant in a multi-tenant system, so we can track everything nicely. This is mostly useful when using Cloaked AI with SAS Shield and not as useful in a single tenant system where you use standalone mode, so we'll just initialize it here with a blank value and reuse it. That said, you can use this system to do your own audit trails and so forth. So we pass all of that information into a configuration object and pass that to an initialized function, and now we're ready to encrypt. So we're going to iterate over the 80,000 items in the data set and encrypt both the vector and the pinecone data set metadata, which is the original Quora sentence. We'll start by putting the dense vector, which is in this values key here, into a data structure that indicates it isn't encrypted. We're passing along a two-part description of where it's stored, which will be used with a key derivation. Now, to encrypt the vector, we call sdk.vector.encrypt, and we pass along the blank tenant ID we initialized earlier. In a multi-tenant system, this would be another level of isolation of encrypted data where you would label the different tenants. Next, we're going to encrypt the original Quora sentences, which they call the metadata, using random encryption calling into our standard encrypt function. And note here that we use Python's bytes function, since the encrypt call expects a dictionary of keys to bytes. Finally, we're going to update the Quora dataset with these encrypted values. Something to note here is that Pinecone will only take text metadata, so we need to base64 encode it, and Python's base64 gives us binary back, so then we further call decode UTF-8 to wrangle it into the right format. We're also going to store another value that was returned to us when we encrypted the metadata, and that's the EDEC, or encrypted document encryption key. We'll need this and the master key in order to be able to decrypt once that's done, we can see what our data now looks like. You can see that the encrypted values are across a much larger range of numbers, both positive and negative. Also, it isn't deterministic, so you'll get different results sometimes. Even the flipping of positive and negative numbers encrypting the same number twice. The other thing to see here is that the metadata is no longer readable. There's a leading set of common characters there that are a header we add that isn't secret, but after that is pure pseudo-random AES encrypted data in Base64. So now we'll upload all of this, and then when that's done, we can make some queries. First we initialize the model, and then we have another block of code that's changed a little bit. We start exactly the same, but then we put the model produced vector into a plain text vector structure with the same labels as we used before, which is important. Then we call generate query vectors to get our query vectors. Okay, now it might seem strange that we pass back an array of encrypted vectors. This is mainly in case you're using SAS Shield, where we have all of these workflows to allow things like rotation of keys. But if you want to continue to have good results while you are re-encrypting your data, then you'll have a situation where some data was encrypted with the old key and some data with the new key for a period of time. And now we run the query. The actual encryption is Zippo for overhead. And now we can see here the original unencrypted query vector next to the encrypted query vector, and then the results below that. And in these results, there's a bunch of meaningless stuff. If Pinecone had passed back the original dense vector too, that would also be meaningless. So anyone looking at logs on Pinecone's side won't learn anything about your data or about what you queried or what results you got back. It's totally private. So as our last step, we need to decrypt those results to see how our query did. If we were just fetching IDs, we probably wouldn't need to decrypt at all. And we can decrypt vectors, though there's rarely a cause for that. In this case, we're going to recreate the encrypted document from the EDEC and the encrypted text, which we decode back to bytes 
and then we pass that to the decrypt function. The results are instantaneous. And we can see that for our question about the most populated city, we got back a top result about the world's largest city and a second to top result on biggest city with a few other results that are pretty close, which is fantastic. Now, if we do effectively the same query again, but using different words, and this time decrypting results in the same block of code where we queried, then we can see that again, we got pretty good results that are quite equivalent to what you get when you aren't encrypting and when you're just using Pinecone in their normal way from their example. So I'll just note quickly that the performance trade-off in this case, meaning how well it matches, not how fast it goes, depends on the model you're using and the approximation factor. We've noticed that the GTE base embedding model had big drops in accuracy, while more common embedding models like MiniLM and Distilbert only lost a few percentage points in accuracy. In our anecdotal testing, you can't really tell the difference between an encrypted query and an unencrypted one as a human looking at the results. And that's it. Cloaked AI is open source software, and we publish all of the details. That open source license is AGPL though, so while you can feel free to test it or look at the code or to use it in GPL compatible open source for free, if you wanna use Cloaked AI in commercial software, you'll need a license. And that is neither expensive nor hard to obtain. It's a flat fee for standalone mode. But if you start to realize that you want the systems that handle key management and audit trails and all the other concerns around an application layer encryption system, then you'll wanna look at pairing it with our other products, including SAS Shield, which is much more powerful as a, as a whole platform. Thanks for listening and hope you have a great day.